right. Well, good morning again. I tell you, <laughs> I am. Oh man, so fired up. I just, you know, I, I oh. Sometimes it's sometimes it, in in reality it's like oh man it's Sunday again already, but a lot of times for me I'm telling you it's like man when's it gonna get here? Because I'm ready. I want to go. You know I, I'm in the middle of this this sermon series on spiritual maturity and I just yeah, I'm so fired up about it. I'm so excited about where we're gonna go in the next few weeks with this yet that the, and somebody just went oh man there's more weeks of this but. Uh, <laughs> Bear with me. It's it's you know if you if you followed along so far, you know that uh, spiritual maturity uh, is something that is a choice. Yes, it's a choice. Although it's commanded by God, we have to decide to do something. That's what my dad used to tell me all the time. Said, "Do something, even if it's wrong." Yeah. I'd be working out in the gym. Big Timmy Stiverson. He used to always say, "You know, when it's your turn to go, you, you you find something to talk about, so you don't have to get in the lift real quick, right?" <laughs> so he'd look all right. Don't just do something. Stand there. But no, spiritual maturity is a choice. You have to decide to get in the game. You have to decide that, that I'm going to make an effort to do something. And we're encouraged to do that because God is with us in the middle of all of that. So it, spiritual maturity is a choice. Spiritual maturity uh, is often hindered by our own lack of self-esteem. We listen to the world's lies that tell us that we're, we're not up to the challenge that we're not good enough that we're not capable of that that you know there's always somebody that's better at doing such and such and and I don't need to grow or I can't grow uh, mature wise because I'm, I'm less than that's not true God created you for a purpose and he created you to understand what his will is for you and he has provided us with an opportunity to learn that and you are not useless you have a purpose in life. And so we, we looked at the, the, to find that, you know, we need to set some goals on how we're going to achieve those things. And then last week we looked at seven habits of spiritually mature people, that they embrace humility and that they uh, read the Bible and pray and spend time with others who are invested in uh, growing uh, spiritually, that they have a, an attitude of gratitude, they live a life of thankfulness for the things that, that they have and the strength that God provides even in the midst of of the messes of life sometimes, and uh, that they release things that, that, that don't bring them peace and joy and kind of graft onto the things that do, and that they have a, a, a giving and serving heart. So today, I want to focus on seven practices for spiritual maturity. And you say, wait a minute, you just went over seven habits for spiritual maturity. And uh, it's not the same sermon as last week, I promise you, because this, this is a little bit different. But I... I remember a story about a church that was looking for a new pastor and they spent a long time trying to find one and they finally they interviewed several candidates and they came up with somebody thought this is the guy and so his first Sunday came and all of the church gathered to listen to it they're all excited to hear what this new pastor was gonna have to say and he delivered a brilliant sermon I mean it, it was it was theolog theologically right on task it was right from the Bible it was delivered with the right amount of enthusiasm and and it was just a, they could track right along I thought it was great I thought man this is the pastor for us they all came back the next week and they sat down and the preacher got up to preach and he delivered the exact same sermon and they're like oh no well, that's a good sermon. You know, maybe I missed a point or two last week, and I'll just take some better notes and follow along. They showed up the third Sunday. He preached the exact same sermon again. And they're like, what's going on with this clown? Fourth Sunday, same thing. And finally, they're going up to the board of directors and like, hey, uh, you're going to have to have a talk with this guy if he doesn't come up with something else. The next Sunday, he comes in, and sure enough, he delivers the exact same message. And so the board of directors pull him aside, and they're like, Pastor, is there any chance that you have another sermon and the pastor said I do and when I see that the first one has been listened to I'll move on to the second one so, <laughs> that's not the case here that's just all joking aside seriously uh, last week we looked at habits this week we're looking at practices they are two distinctly different things what's the difference you ask and I said well I'm glad that you asked a habit, remember our definition from last week, a habit is a settled or regular tendency, especially one that's hard to give up. 
or something that you do often and regularly, sometimes without knowing that you're doing it. A habit is a behavior that's done with little or no thought. It's something that you just step into. And those things that we looked at last week, they can become habits if you do them frequently enough. Habits are things that we do that are so ingrained into our daily lives that it feels awkward if we forget to do it. Kind of like going to bed without brushing your teeth. It's just a little bit weird. It's a habit because you do it all the time. Oh, maybe not. I don't know. Some of y'all might. I, I, <laughs> hello, wake up. But it's a behavior that has been regularly performed, a regularly performed practice so much over time that it becomes a habit. Practices, on the other hand, are something totally different than habits. Well, why is that? You say, well, you heard the adage, practice makes perfect, right? Not true. What practice makes is permanent. I mean, I guess if you practice something very poorly, you could become perfectly poor at doing something. But, um, you know, habits make permanent. And the more you do, or practices make permanent, and the more you do it, the more you layer it in there, the more permanent it becomes. So, but a practice is something that's uncomfortable. And it requires a concerted effort. It requires a decision, a deliberate decision to say, I am going to do such and such. And not all practices will become habits because they're just uncomfortable, because they're hard to do. Um, some things will always inquire, require an intentional, disciplined, persevering uh, attitude to conduct them. You know, while brushing my teeth every night before I go to bed might be a, a habit someday and be awkward if I forget to do it and something that you, you would just do without thinking oftentimes, getting up at 5 in the morning to go for a run in the freezing, drizzly rain every day will never become a habit. It's something you're going to have to force yourself to do every time. Now, maybe not. There might be some runner nuts out there that just think that, hey, this is awesome. Woo, I get to go run in the slop. But for most of us, that is just a, an illustration of what the difference between a practice and a habit is. Practices require intentionality. They require a discipline. They require a drive to make you do it. So here are the seven practices for spiritual maturity. These are the things that you're never going to be perfect at. They're the ones that you're never going to have a total handle on, and you're, you're never going to do them all the time because it's going to be hard sometimes to make yourself do them. But when we understand and practice these elements of spiritual growth, it helps move us in the right direction. So what are these practices? Well, spiritually mature practices. First is practice becoming more selfless. Practice becoming more selfless. Selflessness is about understanding the importance of giving without expecting something in return. Selflessness is being willing to help someone else without recognition and without reward. Practice becoming more selfless. Selflessness is different than self-sacrifice. Self-sacrifice says that, you know, I'm just going to lay down myself for someone else. But selflessness is about prioritizing the needs of others over your own needs and desires. Philippians 2, two uh, 3 and 4 says, do not do anything out of selfish ambi ambition or vain conceit, but rather in humility value others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. Now, why is this a practice and not a habit? Because human nature is always about self-preservation. Human nature says, I take care of mine first. You know, the airplane starts to go down and the oxygen bags drop down. What do you do? You put yours on first, right? Because if you're not preserved, you can't move on. But selflessness puts other people's needs, desires, wants ahead of yours. And practicing becoming more selfless is something that you can always get better at. It's never going to be a habit. Second, practice adjusting how you spend your time. Practice adjusting how you spend your time. Time, like money, is something that has to be budgeted. You know, but household budgets are, are you know, it's, they're hard to do sometimes, but really it's so simple. If your monthly income is $1,500, then your monthly outgo has got to be $1,500, and you've got to budget how that's going to match up. You can't spend money you don't have unless you're in the government, and then you can just print more anytime you want, but in real life, your outgo and your income have to be equal or you're going to be in trouble at some point. 
You have to budget your t money. You have to budget your time. Now, the difference is that, that unlike money, time is a limited resource. It's a closed unit. I mean, if you really wanted a bass boat, and your budget's at X, and your outgo's at Y, and their, their balance is at zero, and you really, really want that bass boat, you can go out and not get a loan, <laughs> print more money, that's the government way of doing it. But you can take on a second job and just start putting money in the, in the bass boat can until you got the money for that, right? It's not a limited resource. You can always make a little bit more money. There's time. You got the same 24 hours everybody else has. And that's all there is. And you don't get any more. The beauty of it, though, is it's a, it's a renewable asset every day. You wake up sucking air today, boom, you got another 24 hours. But how you budget that it determines how it, it lays out for you. And time, like death, is, you know, it winds up being the great equalizer. Everybody gets an equal amount. It's learning how to adjust your time that, that is that practice that is required for spiritual maturity. Ephesians 5, 15 to 17 says, Be careful, or pay careful attention then, how you live. Not as unwise people, but as wise. Making the most of the time because the days are evil. So don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. You've been given a certain amount of time. How you budget that determines how wisely you live. Don't be foolish in that life, Scripture says. Make the most of the time that you're given and understand the will of God for your life. Colossians 4, 5 says, Behave wisely toward outsiders, making the best use of your time. And so the question is, well, how do I learn to practice adjusting my time? Well, what's the best use of it? Just like in a budget, you have to prioritize the things that are, that are worthy and important and necessary and the things that you want to accomplish. And then once you get that prioritized list there, I love how Dave Ramsey talks about when he talks about def, debt reduction, and he's like, you know, you can put everything on the list, and here's all the money I got coming in, here's all the things I owe, and, and everything below the line just gets ignored because I can't do anything about it. He said, and then those bill collectors call and are like, hey, uh, we need some money. And he's like, hey, I don't have any to give you. Sorry, you're below the line. Well, how do I get above the line? Get more important. I don't know what to tell you. But <laughs> you, know, you want to get above the line, it's got to be something that's important enough to get up. Prioritize that stuff, though, so that you, you are just your time, making the best use of the time that you've been given. Psalms 90, 12 says, teach us to remember our days that we, or to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Teach us, Lord, to number our days. Help us to step into this. this. This tells us that we never arrive at perfect time management. But learning how to budget, that adjusting how we do that over and over again moves us in the direction we want to be. Next, next practice. Practice becoming more generous with your resources. Giving it in and of itself can become a habit. It's pretty easy to sit down first of the month and write out that check, send it to the church, you know, uh, it, it, those things can become habit. But becoming, practice becoming more generous with your resources is a little bit different because it's not just about money. What resources do you have? You have the compassion that's been given to you. You have God-given talents and abilities that's been given to you. You have multiple uh, resources that are available. And the idea is practicing to be more and more generous with those things is, is what we want to do. Um, continuing to grow in generosity requires routine practice. It, it, again, it doesn't just happen. Luke 6, 38 says, Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And so as we become more generous with our resources, and, you know, I'm not, I, I always get, cautious about this stuff because I'm not talking about a, a prosperity gospel where, where you pay the price for just right and, and, and the, the receipt comes in. But understand that as we learn to be more generous with our resources, more is given to be responsible with. And that's just the way it is. It, you know, the, that is part of God's way of, that, that's his business transaction. Those that are faithful in little will be given much. And so as we practice growing more and more generous with those resources, with our time, with our energy, with our efforts, with, with all of the different things going on in our community and in our church that, 
that you can lend a hand to, those are the things that we have to be focusing on. Proverbs 11.25, a generous person will prosper, but who, whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. And so this is why we, we talk about serving in our strengths all the time. I talk about it all the time because I'm a firm believer that you should be totally committed to serving in the area that is your strength. You should be doing what you're good at. Stop doing what you stink at. I'm serious, people. We get so caught up. Yeah, but you don't understand, Pastor. This, this ministry is such a great ministry, and it needs to be done. And if I don't do it, if you don't do it poorly, somebody else will come in and do it better, I promise. Stop doing what's not yours to do. Stir your pot. Work out of your skill set. Be engaged in what God has given you to do because then you can refresh others and in yourself be refreshed. Do you understand this, this, this transactional idea of the gospel of Christ, the kingdom of God? When we stay in our own lane, it's a two-way flow. When we start trying to drive in other people's lanes, we wind up in wrong-way traffic. It's a mess. We just want to you know, be a refreshing to others and be refreshed ourselves in serving in those, those strengths. Practice pursuing peace instead of chaos. Now, I know most people don't willingly pursue discord. But we accidentally or habitually get caught up in it frequently. Practice pursuing peace. The things in life that bring rest. The things in life that calm the noise, that settle the discord, that bring things into a state of peace. Psalm 34, 14 says, Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Peace isn't something that just floats your way. You got to go get it. You got to find it. You got to pursue it. But pursue peace instead of chaos. Romans 12, 18 says, If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with everyone. And so, where it's your choice, where you have control, be at peace. Seek it out. Pursue it. Find ways to bring about a settling of all of that turmoil. Practice choosing forgiveness and being forgiven. Practice choosing forgiveness and being forgiven. Colossians 3.13, bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Practice forgiveness. Why is that a practice, not a habit? Because it's hard sometimes to forgive. I have no doubt there are people in your life. There's been family, friends, neighbors, employers, employees that have wronged you in ways that are, are unspeakable. Forgiveness is hard, but you need to practice letting go of that. You need to practice getting over it because the opposite of forgiveness is bitterness. And bitterness will twist and gnarl and scar not only your inner being, but your face as well. It will show up on the outward what's going on on the inward. And that bitter pill that you're eating every day, hoping it harms the person that you're mad at, is never going to accomplish that. You need to practice forgiveness. Practice it over and over and over again because it's hard. But you also, part of that forgiveness, is practicing forgiving yourself. I don't know how many people are here that have lived the perfect life up to this moment. I am not one of them. There's been mistakes in my past. There's been things that, that I regret. There's things that embarrass me even today when I think of them. It's like, oh, what a moron. Why would you do such a thing? But you got to forgive yourself. You are worthy of forgiveness. Not because you earned it and not because you deserved it and not because, ooh, I got it all right, now I can be forgiven simply because you are made in the image and the likeness of the Creator who made you, and He loves you enough that He stepped out of heaven, taking on the form of man that He might die for you. If He forgives you, forgive yourself. Let go of those things 
that are dragging you down from your past. You've got to learn to forgive others. You've got to practice forgiving yourself. You've got to practice accepting God's forgiveness for you. He loves you. He created you. He breathed his life into you. And he wants you to know how much he loves you and bring you into that. Practice strengthening your relationships. Practice strengthening your relationships. Good relationships do not just happen. If you're sitting here today and you got the perfect marriage, awesome, because you worked your butt off to make it happen. Because good relationships do not just happen. Your siblings, your parents, your children, your aunts, your uncles, your neighbors, your co-workers, those relationships are only good if you practice strengthening them. They require work. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up. Pour value into those in your life. Strengthen those relationships. Again, reach out to people in a way that is building them up. Ephesians 4.29 says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only that that is helpful for building up according to their needs. Be careful with that because uh, practicing strengthening your relationships, everybody knows what's wrong with the other guy, right? I'm going to build them up because I know what they need. I got the words for them. Be careful about that, though. Building others up according to their needs, not to what you think their needs are. This is important. You know, you're raising kids. I'm going to tell you, they're not going to think like you. And they're not gonna, you might have one clone, maybe even two if you got a bunch, I don't know. But for the most part, they're going to be different than you. They're going to be a unique bent to them that's different. Don't try to bend them into what you think they ought to be. But strengthen those relationships so that you're there for them in their time of need. And there's a safe place that they can go to when they need something. And lastly, Practice focusing more on the eternal and less on the temporal. Second Corinthians, Paul writes to the church, Therefore we do not, do not give up, even though our outer person is being destroyed, our inner person is being renewed day by day, for our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. So we do not focus on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, and what is unseen is eternal. But what are things temporal? Basically, anything in this life is temporal. It's temporary. It's going to pass away. Scripture says that all things are going to burn up in an intense heat. And the only thing that's going to exist after that is, is, is love. It's, it's going to all go away. Things eternal are what God has set in place. Things eternal are what exists beyond our own moment of satisfaction. And we need to focus more, practice focusing more and more on the eternal things and less and less on the temporal things so that we might become what God has created us to be. Now, it is impossible to, to con cons consistently exhibit these elements of spiritual maturity. These practices, they're not, they're, they're, I'm telling you, they're never going to become habits. There's something you're going to have to decide. I'm going to choose to make a difference about these things in my life. But in Christ, when we practice these elements of spiritual growth, we hold the keys then to the spiritual maturity that we are called to. Spiritual maturity is not a destination. You're never going to arrive there. It's a journey of this life to constantly become more like Christ and less like ourselves in all that we do. And as we grow in this spiritual maturity, um, i got a couple minutes, so I'm just going to share with you just a couple of benefits that come out of this. One is that we overcome doubts. As we put these things into practice and grow more and more in tune with what God has created us to be and do, we can overcome doubts in our life. We start to see where he's showing up where he's real, and that we can put aside all of those little ideas 
that, you know, is this, am I on the right track with this? Am I doing this right? We can start to see where we are overcoming those things. And we learn to surrender control. That's a tough one. Tough one for a guy like me. I mean, there's nothing I like more than just grabbing onto somebody, bending them to where I want them to be. But, you know, that's just not the better way of doing things. Because, it's, first of all, you're, you're going to run up against something that's bigger, faster, and stronger than you at some point. There's going to be a will that's going to break your will. You're never going to be able to do that. Second of all, it's a life full of contention. It's not seeking peace. It's not pursuing peace. It's trying to constantly push people. Surrendering control of things in your life, the things that, that, especially the things that you don't really have any control over, is really a great place to get to. And, and pra these practices towards spiritual maturity put you in a place where you can surrender control. And then embrace your unique gifts. I say it over and over and over again. God has gifted you richly and uniquely. You are you, and you're the only you there is. And to be the best you you can be is really the goal in life. You know, the, 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 the miracle of um, forensic science really bears this out. The fingerprint on your index finger is unique and exclusive to you. No one has that fingerprint no one ever has had that fingerprint, and no one ever will have that fingerprint. Your DNA is unique to you. Your sister doesn't have your DNA. Your identical twin doesn't have your DNA. It is unique and specific to you because you are a unique and specific individual created by God. You are not an accident. You're not here by just some kind of conglomeration of, of cosmic forces. You are an intentional being. And so be intentional with the time that you've been given. Be intentional with your desire to know God. And fight the urge to feel like you finally arrived at spiritual. I'm there. I'm so dialed in. And some of you are so more dialed in than I am. I, I'm serious about that. And, you know, I strive to get there. But don't, don't let up. Don't, don't take a break. Don't say, ooh, I'm there. Become, practice becoming more selfless. Practice adjusting how you spend your time. Continue to practice becoming more generous with your resources. Pursuing peace. Continue to practice choosing forgiveness of others and choosing to forgive yourself. Practice strengthening your relationships and practice focusing more on the eternal than on the temporal. I want to leave with Psalm 15. It says, Lord, who can dwell in your place? Who can live on your holy mountain? The one who lives honestly, practices righteousness, and acknowledges the truth in his heart. The one who does not slander with his tongue and does not harm his friend or discredit his neighbor. The one who despises those who reject the Lord and honors those who fear the Lord. The one who keeps his word, whatever it costs, who does not lend his money at interest or take a bribe against the innocent, the one who does these things will never be moved. Amen. Let us pray. Loving God, we come before you today, again, just thankful for your love for us, for the being that you have made us, the creation that has been brought forth by your hand, in this time and place, Lord, knitted together and specifically gifted for this moment and for this cause. And so, Lord, we pray that you strengthen in us an understanding of our identity in you, who we are, who you've made us to be, and what you have created us to do. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen.